Ignatius Press and the Augustine Institute present The Formed Book Club. Catholic book lovers unpacking good books chapter by chapter. If you like us, please help us by subscribing and by reviewing us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you might listen. And don't forget to sign up for weekly updates and study questions at formedbookclub.ignatius.com. Welcome to the Form Book Club as we continue to discuss under the book, the Church, Paradox, and Mystery. Uh, last session, uh, we covered very important materials. If you didn't listen last time, I suggest you go back to that. We had a good discussion uh, on grace, uh, salvation, predestination. Is there salvation outside the church or not? And the Lubach beautifully sums up what the fathers and the great medieval theologians taught and what the council taught. We continue in this chapter, pagan religions and the fathers of the church. And I wanted to uh, read a quote on page 108. Well, or read, not a quote on page one, but read page 108 here, a new paragraph. Because this has to do with not just the relation of Christ to salvation, but his church to salvation. Look at the problem from the opposite standpoint. If judgment is given as a function of Christ's church, which in pilgrimage toward the Perusia has an integrating and saving mission. So what does that mean? The church has a mission to transmit the salvation of Christ to the world and to integrate all other men and women, and the whole cosmos into that divine life, then it can no longer be a question of considering the various non-Christian religions from a static point of view. As if we can look at these religions as if they're just something in themselves, as independent totalities. All the good in them, we conclude, are such elements as may be integrated in Christ. Lastly, all that can be objectively saved thus has a relationship with the church. In every hypothesis, the search is sense of the man that is looking for God as witnessed by the religious phenomenon around, you know, whether it's uh, even Taoism or certainly Buddhism, Hinduism, Islam, searching for God and paganism must eventually find its true object in the revelation announced by the church to the world. As for the grace that brings about the necessary conversion, it also, so you've got human beings that are made with the preparation by their very mind and heart to accept the gospel. How do they get converted and actually turn to a direct, explicit acceptance of Christ? As for the grace that brings about this necessary conversion, it also comes whatever its secret pathways from the one church of Christ says it is in her that all men must be saved. God has wished to unite himself to humanity. The unique spouse is the church, sola ecclesia gratia coardimimor. That is the only grace of the church by which we are redeemed, as St. Ambrose says. So that's, Again, is that for triumphalism to say, hey, we're already there. Hope you guys get, get, get in too. No, we've been blessed by the historical circumstances that led us into the Catholic Church. But it's not as if we've come into a church which is uh, absent from the lives of all humanity. It's there in some, as he says, uh, secret pathways. In fact, the grace when we were still outside the church, the grace that led to our conversion was coming from the church to us. Exactly right. Uh, I might say as well that um, uh, th this goes back to page 106, and everything, this is five lines from the bottom, everything true and good in the world, so in, including in, in, in other religions, everything true and good in the world, Master St. Paul advises, be taken up into and integrated in the Christian synthesis, where it undergoes transfiguration. Um, and I, I, so that's absolutely true. But I just want to, it's not a caveat, it's merely going from this sublime, where that, that paragraph 
resides to the uh, the lower but nonetheless true the question of pure logic so immediately before that uh, that paragraph you just quoted on page 108 father how for instance is the admission feasible that islam looked at objectively and as a whole might be a divinely constituted way of salvation if one simultaneously admits the same thing of buddhism which the former stoutly affirming monotheism and the latter declaring itself atheist in other words we, we know that that there are any aspects of, of Islam which is good and true and beautiful will be transfigured uh, in its um, coming into Christ. Anything good in Buddhism will be transfigured in its coming into Christ. But Islam uh, in its totality and Buddhism in its totality contradict each other uh, and neither can be fully true uh, either in relation to each other or in relation to Christianity. So that is a, just a, uh, something we need to have in our mind before we get to this higher level that the, the next paragraph takes us to. Okay, and that, Joseph, th there's been a very long discussion related to that, namely, if in a view that some held that unless you are baptized, uh, you are deprived of the beatific vision in heaven, and therefore we have a missionary impulse. We must go and baptize as many as we can, and that actually was the theological view of St. Francis Xavier, who went to India and baptized thousands and thousands, because he thought, they're going into hell if I don't baptize them, you know? Well, if we now go back to a more patristic and centrally scholastic view that no, uh, salvation is still possible to them. Uh, they don't need to be baptized by us with water and the Holy Spirit to enter heaven. Well, then why go out? If they're going to go to heaven anyway, doesn't that, doesn't that simply uh, diminish, if not eliminate, the missionary zeal of the Catholic Church? And by the way, you know, Ralph Martin is famously criticized on Balthasar for the idea that all men are saved, which Balthasar never taught. Uh, but that if we think that salvation is somehow going to be normal or easy or universal, then why go and why go and baptize anybody? Well, one answer is, do you love them or not? Do you think that knowing Christ in this on, in this earthly life and having the sacraments and having a communion of saints and having the guidance of the magisterium, do you think that's worth nothing? Don't you want to share that with people? And so I, I'm perfectly willing to, to say, in fact, it's likely true that there are hundreds of thousands, millions of Muslims who I'm going to see way above me in the heavenly hierarchy at the end of the world because they are, they are completely consistent with their faith, wrong as it is in certain aspects, but they're, they're living as best they can. Where I've been given all these graces, what am I doing? But that does not mean that I should not try and bring Christ to them. You right, know? but also they won't, they won't be Muslims where, in heaven, in that hierarchy. They will be <laughs> baptized Muslims in heaven, albeit, albeit after they die. That's so, true. You know, so it's, very important. it's a very important uh, point of distinction, which I'm, I'm not, I'm not, we're not arguing about. So, yeah, anyway. But, no but, but Joseph, what, you know, why should I go out and try and evangelize Muslims if they're going to be Catholics once they die anyway? Well, no, I understand, and I agree with you. That you know, the, the point is that that uh, that it's all completely about love, as you say. And how do you grow in the love of Christ? Uh, the best way of growing the love of Christ is to get closer to Him, to be in communion with Him. And so, uh, you know, without that, there there are dangers and problems uh, that 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 you that you may get you may get to heaven in spite of that. Um, but it's going to be easier to get to heaven. If you understand Jesus Christ, if you're in communion with Jesus Christ, so it's not. Yeah, I agree. It's, it's about love, but it's also on a more utilitarian me, uh, level. They they have a they have a greater chance. Like someone who has two loving parents have a greater chance of growing up to live virtuous lives than one who's who have one parent or abusive parents. Um, clearly, those people have a problem, right? And it's not their fault. Uh, they have a problem. So God will sort that out. But clearly having two loving parents is beneficial. So clearly having a loving relationship in communion with Jesus Christ 
through baptism and the sacraments is better than not having that. Right. That's right. Imagine if you're, imagine if you were, you know, on a stormy sea in a well fitted, comfortable boat and you're cruising along and you see some guy out there like on a little piece of driftwood, you know, well, he's going in the same direction I am. So why should I pick him up? No, no. You go, Hey, Hey, come on to my boat. It's snug. It's comfortable. It's full of food and good things. And we'll get there together. Yes. And therefore it's incumbent upon us to repair the ship as best we can. So it looks like a safe, you know, and well provisioned vessel instead of a leaky bark, you know, that's, <laughs> that's half, half capsized. <laughs> right. Yes. Well, also, and then, by the way, no, Muslims, what about our Protestant brothers and sisters? I mean, they don't have the Eucharist. They don't have it. Right. Right. And isn't that something we want to share? The, these tremendous gifts that we've been given, not because we deserve them at all. Don't you want to share the gifts you've been given? Exactly. Because you know what, like you just said, Joseph, the sacramental life, what a tremendous gift that is. We know how much we, we rely on that for strength, right? Wouldn't you want to give that to another Christian if you could? Because yeah. you know what strength you derive from it? Yeah, on, on a somewhat natural level, but it's not fully natural. Uh, I've been blessed with no family myself, but knowing many wonderful Catholic families, some small, some large, but I've said for many, many years that in, in the national order, there's nothing more beautiful than a, a loving Catholic large family. I mean, it's just, uh, you go in there, it's wonderful. They have problems, oh, of course, they have divisions, they pro yes, but to, to be able to help people in our country especially understand what a man is, what a woman is. But I'm not a biologist, but I can, I can tell you what they are, by the way. But I mean, and what procreation is meant for and what, and, and what a family is supposed to be. I mean, that's the highest joy you can. And also, if they're suffering, the suffering is transfigured in a wonderful family. I, I see it all the time. So, of course, we, we want to share the faith, not just because it gets us to heaven by the skin of our teeth, but because it allows flourishing here because it means living according to the truth. Uh, okay, I'm, I keep, I'm sorry I keep giving my homilies here and sermons and stuff like that, but I want to just mention on page 114 and following the people that Delubach mentions here. Again, 114, he mentions Jules Monchonin, the priest who went to India. Page 115, he mentions von Balthasar here. Uh, page 116, Terre de Chardin, who also, uh, I think, prior to the council, had in his own way this vision of the convergence that God intends of all the cosmos with the Catholic Church. And then uh, page 118, R.C. Zayner, not a, not a familiar name anymore, but he was the premier uh, expert on uh, non-Christian religions, you know, in the world. He was, he was really a, a very, very accomplished scholar. And so... Quotes if, if, if I could just maybe pluck some uh, epigrams from those pages, just before that, page 113, where this, this, just, I mean, this is just wonderful sort of epigrammatic brilliance. Uh, this is not a quote from those people, this is before section three, but Christ's death on the cross, in Christ's death on the cross, all religion was accomplished. I mean, that in itself should be enough for us to lose ourselves in contemplation for hours. All religion was accomplished in Christ's death on the cross. Then von Balthasar on page 115, the middle of the page there, uh, he extols Christ as the fulfillment of the partial truths contained in the religious myths of all peoples. And this, again, uh, uh, if, if you like, transfigures our own discussion just now, that Christ is the fulfillment of those partial truths uh, contained in, in the other religious stories. Uh, and then this is, who is this? So page 117, who are we on now? Uh, this, uh, I'll clearly pronounce his name wrong, Father, correct me, Teilhard de Chardin. Um, that 
in that indented quote in the middle of page 117, that he describes the church as the consciously Christ absorbed portion of the world. I mean, I love that, right? I and mean, what a definition of the church, the consciously Christ absorbed portion of the world. I mean, that's just enough. I mean, that's enough. You take that from this and it would be sufficient. <laughs> good, yeah. And I love that other line in that same paragraph, Joseph, the church central axis of the cosmic convergence. I thought that would make a great bumper sticker. <laughs> <laughs> it would, it would. Yeah, that's a good idea. Uh, all right. Well, the section four, which begins on page 120, has to do with this idea of, quote, anonymous Christianity, close quotes, because some have drawn as a conclusion, what we've just discussed here, that access to divine life and beauty of vision is present everywhere through the church, and therefore uh, the world is really Christian without knowing it. The whole universe is Christian without knowing it. Well, there is a kernel, a small one of truth there, that that the the church is the bride of Christ and then the body of Christ and incorporates in herself not just all human beings but all creation and that therefore uh, the cosmos is Christian so to speak you know of the hundred billion galaxies they're all Christian uh, and that all human beings are Christian well the Lubach and Balthazar and many others of course have opposed that now, some of them are by saying, no, no, they're going to go into hell, all these people. Whereas the council says, no, we can't say they're going to hell. What we can say is they're not part of, you said Joseph from Teilhard, they're not part of the conscious axis of creation. It's implicit. So the question here, the bottom of page 120 is this. Did the teaching of Christ really bring something quite new to our earth. That is to say, did Jesus simply tell us what was already there? Or did he bring something that was absolutely new in him? Now, the paradoxical answer is both, in the sense that he brings something absolutely new, but what he brings transcends history and is some of the present, prior to his historical presence. Uh, so, on page 122 at the bottom, he says, just as there is one redemption in Christ, there is but one revelation, and it is one church that has received the charge of communicating both the one and the other not just communicating the knowledge that we're saved, but communicating salvation itself, which is Christ. Uh, there's a beautiful expression, you'll probably quote, quote it somewhere, uh, from Irenaeus, and I know the Lubach is fond of using it, also Balthasar. Uh, Omnem novitatem offeret semitipsens uh, what? Ferret, so I, he brought all newness, bringing himself. That Christ is the absolutely new. Well, I say absolutely. Uh, yes, in one sense, but he's also he's fully human. So that's not new in a sense. But the human who is one with the divine and is divinely human, that's something which never happened before, will never happen again except it, if it happens through him. Only by being united with him can we share in that divine human unity. Um, I think it's, uh, it's actually encapsulated in, in that one word, communicating. Because, you know, we, we think of the word communicating as just, you know, one person speaking to another or, uh, or signaling to another in some other way. Because, of course, you know, in Christ, communication, communicating is, is communing as in, as in communion. In other words, his body is that which holds us and binds us together. That's the ultimate communication that Christ brings to the church. And it's that, if you like, which is the 
powerhouse that drives everything else. And you'll love this etymology, Joseph, because communion, to communicate means to be in communion. Cum is with, unum is one, and to communicate means to make oneself one with the other. It doesn't simply mean to pass on some information. Uh, in fact, that reminds me of something. I, I'm sorry, I don't know the story here, but when I first got to Germany, uh, I got to know this Ferdinand Ulrich, a wonderful philosopher who died recently, and I went to one of his classes, and he was teaching a class in the Pedagogische Hochschule, which is a sort of the educational school of the university, and, and not the, you know the deep philosophy part of the university. And he was teaching these students who at the time were very indifferent to Christianity, if not hostile. And I remember this one lecture, went on for 45 minutes, but basically it went like this. He said, look, you know, when you, when, when you love someone, you want to share it yourself, right? And so you, you share your ideas, you, 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 you buy things, you share meals, and, this, and they share with you. And this idea of, of love is a desire to communicate, to share oneself with another. And so even our, our speech is a form of communication, sharing our ideas, our thoughts, our dreams, our ideals. But he said... Wouldn't it be amazing if instead of all our words and all our senses and all our species and this, if somehow we could gather up all that we are and all that we desire and, and uh, our very being, and if we could just kind of concentrate just in one word, you know, just in one word and give that to the other. Well, wouldn't that be wonderful? Well, they're sitting there kind of in awe, and I'm thinking, he's talking about the incarnation, but they don't know it. But it was his way of showing what that that path is, Joseph, we mentioned at the beginning here, uh, that this desire for full communication, not just we want to be in social media in some virtual reality, but actually to give ourselves to another and receive another, uh, that, you know, is the perfection of love. And that's what the church offers the world. Uh, communicating both the one and the other, that is, uh, redemption and revelation. Now, on Anonymous Christianity, page 123, about a third of the way down, that, quote, anonymous Christians, close quote, will be found in diverse milieu where one way or another the light of the gospel is penetrated, no Christian could possibly still deny. Even that one might find this light elsewhere by virtue of some secret operation of the Spirit of Christ may also be admitted, dot, dot, dot. Given all this, however, it would still be illogical to decide in favor of an, quote, anonymous Christianity, quote, quote, spread throughout the world. Because you know something? Christianity is also incarnate and meant to be incarnate. And one thing the church does, it's the conscious incarnate manifestation of the grace which is offered to all and in some secret way may be present to all. But it's meant to lead to the expression of that in an incarnate way, which is what we do in the church. I'm sorry, I just, this, you know, Dillenbach, I love him and, and, and what he writes, I just find it so powerful, I can't, I can't help myself. You guys have to stop me once in a while. Um, I actually was very grateful for your little tangential trip to Germany there because that was, yeah, that, 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 that lecture was worth sharing. Uh, on page 126, he said, you know, what if we say, if we, if we label the whole universe, all mankind is anonymous Christians, he says, three lines down, it would be like the gift of a kind of label which we could attach to a vessel while its contents remained unchanged. Dot, dot, dot. In short, it would only serve to identify an existing reality. His whole point here is that Christ did not simply come to tell us how wonderful we were and that we were already divinized. No, he came to be the divine one who divinized us and reveal that to us. Redemption or divinization and revelation are one in Christ. And they, on page 127 in the middle, he says, in Jesus, there has appeared to us not only the one who reveals to man what man already was, but also through the perfect illumination of the divine light, quote from St. Gregory of Nyssa, the one who changes man by revealing to him the depths of God. This is, uh, and you know, that goes back to why we want to share the sacramental life of the church with others, because it's by 
living a sacramental life that you're consciously participating in your own transformation, that, that you're, you're availing yourself of all the ways by which God is communicating himself with you in a very deliberate way. And it's not that he can't speak to you and give himself to you in other ways, but that very tangible physicality of the sacraments and your physical presence and engagement with them, why wouldn't you want to share that with other people? Well, I'm going to say something. It's page, bottom of page 126, because, uh, you know, I, I, I want to make sure we, we, we keep this in mind in, in relation to everything else we're saying. Four lines from the bottom. And if we must say with the author of the epistle to the Hebrews that a covenant made in Jesus Christ has made obsolete the covenant made with Moses, how much the more must we agree that in relation to this new covenant, all natural religions or spiritual situations previous to this event are obsolete? So um, yeah, I did really stating that to make sure that we don't fall into or uh, anybody listening or watching falls into the belief that because we're talking about the fact that anything good uh, in Islam will be transfigured in Christ, that we're somehow saying that Islam is equal to Christ or fine and this sort of relativistic understanding. So this is, you know, that basically um, that all that's good, true, and beautiful is fulfilled in Christ uh, and anything in relation to that fulfillment is obsolete. Yes, and this is reflected in the Gospels, especially Luke's Gospel. I think it's, it's chapter 9, verse 51, where it says, And Jesus set his face resolutely toward Jerusalem. Now, what does that mean? He spent most of his public life teaching in Galilee, teaching, preaching, and healing, pouring miracles. At a certain point, as opposition rose, he turned to the sacrifice, to Jerusalem. Prior to 951, in Luke's gospel, Jesus will say, when they find someone baptizing in his name, he who is not against me is with me. This idea that if you're not opposing Christ, you know, you're secretly or implicitly with him. But after he turns his face to Jerusalem, after he's revealed himself and the, the, the hostility comes, he then says, he who is not with me is against me. And so, that goes back to this idea of outside there's just no salvation. Uh, if you've never known Christ but lived a good life, you're with him. But if you've really known him, accepted him, and then turned away from him, you, you know, you're not with him. You know, you're against him. Especially when what you're against is his redemptive act which you just said, he had set his face to Jerusalem. He was on his way to the cross. And so the reason why we can't just have a pantheon with all the religions just as they are within it is because many of these religions actually deny the salvific work of Christ. And if you're denying that consciously and deliberately, then you're actually denying the access to grace that you're being offered. Exactly right. Amen. Well, I think we've covered that fairly uh, substantially. Uh, why don't we call it a session at that, and we'll start next time with uh, Chapter 5. How's that sound? Sounds good to me. All right. Thanks, everyone, for watching, listening. Hope to see you on our next session. God bless you all. If you enjoyed this discussion, Please help spread the word about the Forum Book Club by subscribing to the podcast and writing a review. You can sign up for weekly updates at formedbookclub.ignatius.com.